Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and start. It's our pleasure today to welcome Ed Shi finally to Microsoft Research at Redmond. Um, we're super psyched to have him here. Ed's running the distributed cognition, or wait, you call it the augmented social cognition group at PARC. Uh, we have known Ed for many, many, many years. I think it, my relationship with Ed goes back to when he was a PhD student at University of Minnesota with Joe Constant, and he was showing some really cool visualization of Excel spreadsheets. And um, I've watched his work uh, with great interest over the years and watched how he's matured into leading a group now at PARC um, that does research in this area we're going to hear about today. And he continues to publish and impress, and I'm looking forward to his talk today. Welcome. OK. Um, how do we turn this on? OK. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this is my first visit to Microsoft ever. Uh, I've never been to Ritman, so it's kind of nice to finally get here. And uh, I kn I've known many of you over many years, uh, so it's it's always a pleasure that when people are willing to listen to you for a whole hour. I mean, that's precious time. Um, as Mary mentioned, I've been leading this group called Augmented Social Cognition at Park. If you guys don't mind, I'll just sit because this is a little easier for me to operate. Um, uh, and uh, Peter Perley, ironically, now reports <laughs> into me. And uh, I have a bunch of people, uh, uh, Li Chen Hong, who graduated from Stony Brook, Ban Wang Su, who's Ben Peterson's student, um, Gregorio Convertino, who's Jack Carroll's student, and Les Nelson, who worked at FXPAL for many years, and Rowan Naren, who is an Irish uh, uh, programmer for me. Uh, has been doing some amazing work on something called Mr. Taggy that I was kind of hoping to show live, but I'm going to have to just do a video. But um, uh, this is me in my office. And uh, this picture was taken actually just two weeks before uh, I got married. <laughs> so you see a, a bottle of wine there that someone had given me, actually. And um, so the, way, the reason I'm showing this picture is because I've been focused on sort of single user interface, you know, one person with one computer systems for a long time, about four, 14 years worth of research. Uh, and you see that I'm really into different user into input devices and things like that. And, uh, but I've actually done a lot of work um, in both visualization and as well as modeling of the web, uh, mostly on systems that utilize information sent or information forging that have been published in places like uh, Tokai and Kai and IUI, et cetera. So that's how I know many of you. Um, but I'm actually not going to talk about any of this stuff. So if you are interested in this, ask me questions later or uh, in our slots or whatever. But what I wanted to talk about is actually a summarization of about 12 papers in the last two years that has been produced in my group. And um, I want to start out by um, talking about this guy, Steve Carroll, who um, had a great line in the office that I, li I really liked, uh, which was the fact that Wikipedia success has been so counterintuitive. Um, Wikipedia is, he says, Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can edit anything they want about any subject. So you know you're getting the best information possible. <laughs> the funny thing about this is that all the researchers kind of squirm in their seats and this, this just can't possibly be true. But in reality, when we go back to our desktops, we use Wikipedia all the time. So what's happening here? And uh, I contend that if you were a uh, venture capitalist sitting in, uh, on Sand Hill Road, and someone had come to you in 2001 and said, I'm going to just create this collaborative encyclopedia where anybody can edit anything they want. And here's a wiki, and just tell the world to go at it, right? I don't think anyone would have given this person, you know, not even $100,000 at the time. And yet, you know, seven years later, uh, Wikipedia became this amazing thing. So um, this is some of the, the kinds of data that we were looking at three years ago when we were starting the group. Wikipedia growing from about uh, 10,000 ranked website to about the seventh most 
trafficked website in the world in the space of about four and a half years with 15 people on staff, right? So right here, this room has about more than 15 people. So we should have the same amount of impact, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, clearly something else is at work here. Um, this is another graph that I find interesting, which is uh, from Alexa. This is uh, the, the line in blue is the, um, a, a uh, CNN.com and a, a measure called Daily Reach, which is the number of people out of 100 on average who end up on CNN.com on that given day. Um, this, in red here, this is Wikipedia and surpassed uh, around, right around the beginning of 2006. Pretty amazing with 15 people on staff. And CNN.com is this you know, huge old media commodity, right? I mean, so what's happening here? There's something really unique that's going on in, in social computing. So um, my experience with Wikipedia started out when um, I, uh, I'm a big snowboarder. So that's why I mentioned that uh, before. And one of the problems I was having as a snowboarder was this thing called wind burn. And it's no matter how much uh, sunscreen I put on my face, I always end up with this goggle eye thing at the end of the season. So one season, a couple of years ago, I finally decided to go and look up what was going on with my face. And um, so I, uh, I went on the web and searched for what is windburn. And it actually took me 45 minutes to learn what really windburn was. Actually, windburn is uh, tiny little water or ice molecules in the air that is ripping the oil off your skin. So basically, for those of you who go and get facials, it's like getting a free facial, OK? <laughs> uh, except I didn't want it. So I wanted to know how to prevent it. And pretty much the only thing that you can do is actually put uh, really thick oil on your skin so that uh, over time, it's, you know, it, it doesn't. So anyways, the point is that I started this Windburn article. And lo and behold, after a year or so, it actually morphed into a really interesting article and becomes the situation where it took me 45 minutes to learn this and now it only takes somebody 30 seconds. Go into some search engine, type in Windburn, boom, they get a Wikipedia page, they understand what's going on here. So there is a sense that the, the whole group of people are coming together to utilize these systems to make sense of complex topic and actually give each other tips. So that's at the high end of collaboration spectrum that's happening involving lots of people in, uh, in Wikipedia. Middle of the spectrum is systems that um, still uses implicit coordination in some form, uh, but used to organize photographs, for example. So Flickr, a um, couple years ago, I was going to Cambodia. I wanted to know what are the major sites. And Flickr has this feature, which I think they really improperly buried in their interface. But it's a system where they use clustering of the tags to group all the different major photograph categories that you should take a look at. So the first category up here is actually Angkor Wat, which is this uh, stone temples that were built in the 13th century. Really amazing place um, in, in Cambodia. The second group here is uh, the capital city. The third group here is river and boats. So because it's, I think it's part of the Mekong River Delta. And then the fourth one here is um, actually got pictures of skulls and things because of the Khmer Rouge uh, regime. And so automatically clustered all the kinds of major tourist areas that people go to. And you can take a look at the picture. Think if you, you know, maybe want to visit some of these places. So systems that use these tagging data to organize information. And then finally, um, there are systems who use very simple collaboration uh, technology voting uh, systems to increase signal to noise ratio uh, to measure information faddishness. So dig.com is an example of this. The most bookmarked item uh, in Delicious is an example of this. And generally, sort of auction markets and economic markets, uh, you know, for example, PageRank, where one page gives a vote to another page is an example of, of systems like this. So, a way to think about all these different kinds of social systems then is on the one hand, you have voting systems uh, at, at, at one, one end, very uh, low amount of lightweight social uh, processes. On the other end, you have Wikipedia, where people actually debate and have edit wars with each other and conflicts with each other. 
those are more on the collaboration, uh, uh, co-creation end. And it turns out that you can bring a lot of different kinds of academic studies to the study of these problems. So um, you have the understanding of microeconomics on the one end, uh, the social network analysis and data mining in the middle, and then you have these understanding of conflicts and coordination, CSCW kinds of things, you know, Jack Carroll's work, Bob Crow's work, uh, et cetera, and, the, and on this other end of, of research. So in terms of um, social computing, what we were interested in was this new ability to gather all this data and a, a, a opportunity to understand social cognition, what we call social cognition at a much deeper level. So uh, I worked with two prominent cognitive psychologists for many years, Stu Card and Peter Paroli, and I never bothered to look up the definition of cognition. I just said, oh, cognition is you know, people thinking, right? I actually went and finally looked up the definition of cognition in the dictionary, and I love the definition. It's the ability to remember, think, and reason. Really tight and very nice definition. And then I looked up the definition for the word, the phrase, social cognition, and then I was surprised because I don't have actually a very strong uh, psychology background. I just learned it through osmosis. I didn't know social psychology that well, but it turns out that the phrase social cognition were used by social psychologists to mean the uh, cognitive processes that are involved in social relationships. So imagine that you're 13 years old and you're in middle school. And uh, you know Mary is the most popular girl in school, and Jessica is really good friends with Mary. So if I got to know Mary, and then I'll get to know Jessica as well, and then maybe I get to date the most popular boy in school or whatever. Right? So that is what people used to call social cognition. And I thought, man, that is a really terrible definition. Because if cognition is the ability to remember, think, and reason, then what we really should be talking about is social cognition as in the ability of a group of people to think and reason. So the kinds of things that I've been talking about with Wikipedia and Flickr, et cetera, are examples of real social cognition, not this cognitive process involving social interaction. So that's why we ended up calling the research group Augmented Social Cognition. It has a bit of that academic overtone to it. But I think it actually has a very straightforward definition, which is the augmentation of a group of people, that their ability to remember, think, and reason. So actually, George on a cart is a augmented social cognition device, right? Because you're trying to collaborate with him. And, and now that you have two of them, that makes it even more social. Uh, so anyways, that's uh, by way of introduction to the research area. And so what we've been doing in the last two years uh, is sort of going over this loop over and over again. You know, if you want to understand an area, what you should do is start with characterization. So John Tukey, who used to uh, consult with us at Park regularly, he used to always say, you know, before you get into a problem, have you gotten a really big piece of paper, find a big conferencing room table like this, put it down, and start drawing your data sets, and figure out what is going on in the data through, through just plotting. And so that's what, where we actually started. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about characterization. This is work that um, we did with uh, Nikki Couture, who was an intern of mine uh, in 2006. So the first thing we did was we were interested in um, sort of this idea of, is this, is this these kinds of social systems kind of like Big Bang systems where they keep growing and bigger and bigger and bigger? Or does it reach some sort of equilibrium? Does it plateau? That's, uh, you know, what, what are the maintenance costs involved in dealing with Wikipedia? So would Wikipedia over time just decay is a one major question. So um, what we did was we, we downloaded a whole copy of Wikipedia. And this was back when we didn't have a cluster of workstations. So it was we couple up, you know, uh, machines kind of uh, on the side. The management didn't know we were doing this research kind of hide it under a table. Uh, and um, by the way, it turns out that, that we had tried to use Hadoop, a map reduce system, to try to decompress all of Wikipedia, which at that point was around a one terabyte. And um, using MapReduce actually didn't work. What actually worked was us going and buying 
lots of disk and just letting one processor run on it uh, for a while. And that was what worked really well because the data had to get into MySQL and that turned out to be the, the uh, major bo bottleneck. But anyway, once we were able to finally get the data into the database, um, we analyzed all the different edits going into different namespaces and discovered that um, the amount of work where if you count one edit as being uh, one unit of work um, actually has been decreasing over time. So people were spending a lot of time talking to each other about the topic, talking to each other through e sort of Wikipedia-like emails, and then they're spending a lot of time talking about policy issues. They spend a lot of time talking about, well, is this really spam or is that really spam? You know, is this edit war more valid than that edit war? Um, and so there are a lot of debate that happens here. And then there's a lot of maintenance on uh, people who like to use uh, four-letter words and uh, spam bots, et cetera. So what, what in 2006, at least, what we were interested in knowing was the shape of this thing. Does it come down and plateau like this over time? Or would it start going back up? Or would it keep going until it goes down to 50, 40, 30%? We didn't know the answer to that. And actually, some, um, uh, we're just starting to, up, you know, two years later, we feel like it's time to kind of revisit this question. This has actually plateaued. So what that means is that it's actually have, Wikipedia has reached kind of this uh, equilibrium point where there's a lot of maintenance work that's going on in there. When you measure, I guess it's your talk more about this, but do you exclude anything like vandalism? Yeah. Now, it turns out there's a whole science about how to deal with vandalism because there's two ways of, of measuring vandalism. One is that when people mark something as being van, uh, vandalism, they'll either type RVV or RV, which is revert due to vandalism, so they get rid of that edit. But what you really need to do actually is do a um, compute the CRC of the article and figure out what was actually being reverted. And then we did that computation within Hadoop to figure out what was the best way to, to measure vandalism. And it turns out that if you pay attention mostly just to the people who clicked on the revert button and put in RV or RVV or revert, just doing some string matching. That gets you most of the spams. So all Not all of it, all but almost. So all that has been filtered out. All the bots has been filtered out. There is a whole set of standards of how robots are supposed to mark themselves within Wik Wikipedia, just the same way that in the web you have these robot exclusion standards. There is a similar set of standards for, for Wikipedia as well. So we had to do all that work just to get clean up the data, um, which is annoyingly hard for something so simple, actually. Um, but another thing that we were really interested in, as I said, was uh, understanding conflict and coordination within Wikipedia. So one of the things that we did was this, uh, this problem, which was we, we sat down and thought about, we wanted to measure conflicts in Wikipedia, but how do you do that? Well. Uh, uh, I, when I was taking a shower, I actually came up with this idea, which was that it turns out that since anyone can mark an article as being controversial, that, and anyone can take that tag away, if this wasn't an administrative action. It was, it, you didn't have to be a super user to do it. So in a way, whether an article is controversial or not, it's a consensus mechanism in place, so to, sort of. Um, and so one way to do this would be if you take articles uh, from revision 1 to revision 10, you looked at how many revisions that it has gone through where people continue to label it as being controversial. And then you take another article and do the same count. The articles that have that been more controversial are the ones that tend to have uh, more marks of being controversial. So we call this controversial revision count, very simple idea. And then we um, try to bring up a bunch, all a bunch of different kinds of page metrics. This is the, your standard factor analysis approach to, to characterization, right? So you might think that the more revision that the article has, the more likely that it will be controversial. Uh, the longer the page it is, the more likely it will be controversial, and so on and so forth. The more number of anonymous edits, that the more controversial it will be. You know, you know, so these are all viable sort of hypotheses that you could do. And then what we did was, we applied um, machine learning, uh, just straight 
uh, SVM uh, to the problem. And we got on the one axis, uh, the x axis, the predicted controversial uh, number of predicted CRC, controversial revisions, on one side, and then the actual controversial revision on the other. And then just plotted this. Because, you know, a lot of data are bunched up down here, so uh, it's, it's hard for you to see that. So I put the R square up here so you can see that it's actually a pretty good, pretty good fit. Uh, another validation that we did was, uh, was, you know, every time you plot something, you've got to verify by hand. Does this data point make sense, right? So there's one data point that's all the way out here. Twice as much controversy than any other article. So we thought, oh, that must be, uh, you know, the Iraq War or uh, Catholicism or, you know, religion or, you know, some, one of these, these things, right? So, so what is that point? Well, it turns out that it's a combination of all those things. <laughs> so when we saw that data point, we say, oh, okay, that outlier makes sense. You know, that, it, okay. So we're, our data is not off. Right, uh, and it turns out that if you do this factor analysis, these are some interesting things that pop out. Um, so the more revision there is, yes, it's more likely to be controversial. Uh, the more minor edits, lo tiny little fixes, the more likely it's controversial. Uh, those all make sense. I just want to point out two that's very interesting here. So the more number of anonymous edits to the talk page, meaning in the discussion page, the more controversial things get. However, the more anonymous edits to an article page, the actual content of the article, that actually decreases conflict. Mm -hmm. So our hypothesis for, for explaining this is that the more point of views are actually represented on the article, that actually tends to discourage people from being, you know, saying, hey, this is not right, etc. right? But uh, the more people sort of not leave their name and just say this is wrong and I think this should be changed without signing their name, without attribution, in the discussion that is more likely to increase uh, controversy. So this is something that we wanted to look into a little bit more but haven't had a chance to. But that, that's something that's interesting that came out of this factor analysis. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just getting so much audio cut out. I'm still getting video and time. I just wanted to get the audio. Okay. I can send the slides to you, John. Um, so another thing that we did was just uh, very simple characterizations. Like, so for example, there's um, um, Banshin would know this. There's a set of islands in between Japan and Korea called in, in the Koreans call them Dokdo, and the Japanese call them Takeshima. And what was happening was this edit war where a Korean person would go to the Takeshima page, take all the content that's there, move it over to the Korean Dokto page, point the Takeshima page to the Dokto page, and change it so that it's very pro-Korean. And then someone would come and take all the content from Dokto, move it over to Takeshima, change all the references, etc. And this would go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it turns out that if you just take this very simple idea of Nodes naturally attract each other, but if people revert each other, they repulse each other. Very simple graph layout uh, technique. Uh, what you get is a group of people, uh, group A, who are sympathetic to the Korean point of view. A uh, group of, well, B and C are both kind of sort of more sympathetic to the uh, Japanese point of view. Um, and then group D, which are all the people who are attracted by the traffic and just want to spam and, you know, come to my... Uh, kitchen countertop uh, company website at this address. So there's um, a lot of people who are just spamming. So this is a common pattern that you can see in a lot of these edit wars. Another example is uh, the Terry Schiavo case. So you have a group of people who are sympathetic to the husband, a smaller group of people, interesting, because you, know, uh, um, you, know, you can now sort of debate about the liberal bias of Wikipedia and all that sort of things that are very high very political in, in, in Wikipedia. And then you have a group of people who are mediators, these administrators who are trying to make sure that this thing doesn't blow up. It's a great name for a mediator. Yeah, neutrality. <laughs> uh, in fact, anyone who's labeled, uh, is being colored green here is an administrator. So you can see that there's a lot of more administrator in this group. There are a few administrators who are apparently kind of taking one side versus another, which is kind of interesting as well. And then you have a group of people who are uh, 
vandals and spammers. So that's an example of the kind of characterization that we're, uh, we've been doing. Um, and then, okay, so then the second move is to do some modeling. Uh, by the way, that was all material that was published in WIST and CHI, so if you want to look up the detail of that. Um, and then we've been uh, also interested in doing some modeling. Uh, so one of the things that have been intriguing me for a while is this, uh, these social tagging systems. This is published in Hypertext. Uh, and it's this process, which is that people are looking at these documents, and these documents are about certain topics, and users kind of pay attention to these documents, and they pick out concepts, and they're thinking about these concepts in their head, and that's how they try to generate keywords, right? So on the one side, you kind of have this encoding process where people are looking at these documents and coming up with these concepts and then typing in keywords, tags, uh, to actually uh, uh, remember these documents. And then, say, three months later, they're trying to recall, what was that web page that I found? And they kind of go through this decoding process, where they say, oh, what was the word that I used? What was that web page? And they try to use recall in their, in, in their head to actually you know, get at that specific piece of information. The problem, of course, recall is a noisy process. So there's noise in between. And, there, and, and the encoding process itself is also noisy. right? So I've just characterized the entire social tagging problem in terms of a information foraging information theory perspective of encoding and decoding. So you could actually use information theory to study this problem. How well are people encoding things and how well people are decoding things? So it turns out that you could see things like, for example, if you just look at the vocabulary uh, uh, evolution, you see that uh, over time the bits were getting greater and greater. So in case it's been a while since you've taken information theory classes, uh, this is sort of think of this as being a measure of diversity or the, the, the measure of, of how much Brownian motion there is in the system, right? So it was increasing and increasing, and then actually it saturates. So people actually start to run out of new tags to apply. Um, so that sort of makes sense. You know, you have a vocabulary saturation uh, issue. I'm sort of you know, you're the expert on this sort of stuff, so. <laughs> What's the user interface look like in this? Because this is delicious data. So to the extent that tags are suggested, you might expect this action part to be heard. To the extent that they're generated um, by humans, then you might expect the person to be heard. Absolutely. And, and so one of the hypotheses that we have, but there's no way to test this, is that this saturation may occur actually because of the suggestion interface and not necessarily because of the, the brain interface is not good enough. Uh, but so what you really would like to do is have two systems, one in which one has a suggestion system, a system and the other one doesn't, and see over time, you know, you run a two-year experiment and see whether the saturation happens again, and at what point, et cetera. Et cetera. But we don't have that data. Quick one on the information theory side. Yeah. As you, as you plateau around 11.5, there's, I think what you're saying is that it doesn't mean that intrinsically the entropy of the tags themselves in a nominal tagging system would be as high as 11.5. Well, one of the things that we started reading is a lot of science articles on, um, there's actually been linguists who studied vocabulary saturation within natural languages itself, right? So, uh, and, and I haven't had the time to really go into that literature. But um, it would be very interesting to find out whether this 11.5 correspond to anything in real, uh, you know, computational linguist literature. My suspicion that you, is that even if you take the suge suggestion, the tag suggestion interface away, the plateau it will still happen, but it may happen at a different point. Okay. I guess what, what, are yeah. units, yeah. what are the units? Bits? Or These are bits. 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 Yeah, bits. It's too low. Yeah. So, um, there, it's only bit. People, no, it should be able to go up to 20 to 20 questions. Higher, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm ver I was actually really sad to. See on my on my schedule. I wasn't going to talk to Sue because I was going to pick her brain about this problem. <laughs> um, and, and so then, then you can also start looking at um, conditional uh, entropy as well. So you can see, well, if I gave you all the information there is to know about the distribution of tags, what is the distribution of the documents? Well, you you our hypothesis was you know maybe if people were so focused on only certain sets of documents, 
you know, they're only paying attention to the 1% of the documents on the web, then maybe this was also a plateau, but that is not happening. So this is still growing up. And actually, we have data um, outside the delicious right now. We have the largest bookmarking uh, data set uh, than anybody, so I, at, at least as far as we know. I don't know the situation here at Microsoft, but we have uh, around 160 million bookmarks. And delicious has about 500, uh, is what I heard from Joshua Schachter. So we think that we can, at this point, I can actually compute this all the way out to here. So two years later, I'd be interested in finding out whether this plateaued or not, or whether it keeps going. My expectation is that this will keep going up. That, that's my hypothesis. Something that's interesting in this data set is this, um, which is that uh, uh, over time, one of the ways in which users seems to be uh, responding to this evolutionary pressure is by adding more tags per bookmark. It's the same thing that's happening in web search, where as the amount of documents in the web has increased, people are using more and more words to find the specific leading information that they're, they're interested in. So in web search, the number of query words follow a similar trend of going from about 1.8 to 2.8, I think, in the late 90s, and then 3.4, I think, in the early 2002, 2003-ish. I haven't followed the latest data, but I think it's up to about 3.44 words uh, at this point. So this kind of increased number, mean number of tags per bookmark is also happening. Um, and then you can look at mutual information, and you find that you know, as a system, if I give you tags, what do you know about documents? And vice versa, what, if I give you documents, what do you know about tags? That mutual information curve has been dropping, actually. So this points out sort of that noise problem uh, that was, was, was bringing up. And so Mr. Taggy, which is a system that we've built, we've built to try to combat this problem, sort of was motivated by this kind of modeling. OK. So um, one of the, uh, the next thing that we're interested in doing is prototyping and evaluation. Okay. So, one of the systems that uh, we've been building with, uh, with the insights from all these characterization studies around Wikipedia is this hypothesis that was actually put forth by, um, there's other people who've, who put forth this idea, but you know, one of the more well-cited paper on this was Tom Erickson and Wendy Kellogg's work on the idea of social translucency. So the fast dash work that Banchin has been working on actually is an example of this kind of I ideation, which is that if you make activities and, and, and you know, make better awareness systems, then perhaps uh, people will have more effective communication and, and collaboration. So we, uh, given that what we know of the social dynamic that was happening in Wikipedia, one of the things we thought was, well, if we can engineer a system where we give all that social dynamic information available to the editors, then maybe their behavior will start to change. And so uh, we built this system, system called Wiki Dashboard, um, where uh, you can, by the way, you can just go to wikidashboard.com or wikidashboard.park.com and just see this. We used to have a live fee from Wikipedia, but recently they broke the link. This is one of the problems with working with external uh, uh, mashup systems is that they have a contract with you, but they can break it at any time, right? So right now we only have data up until 2008, February or so, but for a while, we actually had live data from it. Um, and uh, so here, for example, well, it's kind of washed out. Um, I'll just uh, have to talk through this. But um, here's Hillary Clinton's page. And you actually get the live um, data from uh, Wiki Wikipedia. So we, you actually see the live article. And then the visualization on top is basically, here's the overall aggregate activity in blue up here. And then the top 10 editors, or 20, that's changeable if you want. Uh, basically, very fast dash like, right? Um, and uh, the contribution patterns over time. And so you can see that actually it turns out that um, on this page, at least, the top contributor is this guy named Wista Time R, who's made 1,154 edits, which is nearly 20% of all the edits. And you can see that his contribution pattern is almost solidly red right here, right? So he's kind of either a gatekeeper or has an ax to grind or something like that. And what you can do now is click on that name and actually get to 
his contribution pattern, uh, I know it's his because we actually, he actually ended up writing to us because we used him as an example and said, how can you use me as an example? Um, but <laughs> what's very interesting here is that you see that his contribution pattern is says Hillary Clinton, John McCain, uh, Rudy Giuliani, Mike Gravel, and then it's Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> And, you know, and if you keep browsing down, he actually is interested in Dixie Chicks and things like that. So he's apparently interested in one particular kind of music, plus all the New York-ish kind of politician, at least focusing on the presidential kind of things. So the idea is that you kind of get this very quick, fast resume about this person, and then you can say, okay, this is the kind of person I'm dealing with, and then you can, you know, maybe change your response or whatever to, to suit that that communication style that this person may have taken up. So, uh, so that's an example of the kind of uh, 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 wiki dash uh, uh, prototyping that we've been doing. Um, running rapidly out of time. Uh, but in CSCW, we did this um, uh, evaluation where we actually used Mechanical Turk and asked people to look at visualizations of, of this system. And we had a three by two by two design where Either we show them a very high trust uh, visualization of high stability visualization or low stability visualization or no visualization at all. And then we show them different kinds of articles, either they're controversial articles or no controver uh, not controversial articles, or whether they're high quality uh, articles or low quality information. So these are the kinds of visualization that we show them. Not quite wiki dashboard like, but close enough contribution patterns over time um, and then the low trust visualization is exactly opposite, so uh, very highly unstable recently, uh, whereas the um, high trust one is, uh, was unstable in the past and now has plateaued, right? So that's the basic idea. And then asked um, how people will respond to this. Um, so uh, we reported this uh, with, had 253 participants, 673 ratings, we pay seven cents per rating, so seven times for four, forty-two dollars, forty-five dollars, um, and then we got this kind of result, and very robust actually. So, um, what you see is this kind of uh, this x-axis here is the different kinds of whether these two is controversial articles, these two are uncontroversial articles, um, and then you have high quality, low quality, high quality, low quality, and then the different. Of shades here are the three different um, uh, visualization interfaces: the high stability, the baseline, and then the low stability. Okay, so this is the three by two by two that you're seeing in one chart, right? And so, what was the task you were asking? The, for the trustworthiness? Yeah. So the task was we asked them, please rate the trustworthiness of this article, and we, we asked them to pay attention to the visualization, uh, and 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 basically get that rating and then, and then computed uh, the, the aggregate statistics and then the ANOVA here. So does this just say that people who see a lot of change now say that the article is untrustworthy? That's a basic that's summary, okay. yeah, right. So, one, so without going into the more detail of the interpretation of the results, you're using Sue's summary, which is perfect. Uh, one of the things that you want to think about here is then if the visualization have that much effect, uh, it, it now becomes a visualization design problem. You have to be very careful about what you present because what you present to people is what people are going to pay attention to. And if you present the wrong thing, you're going to get the wrong idea, right? So if, if you present the wrong metric and it's actually highly unstable and in, and in fact you present a visualization that looks like as if it's stable, then people are going to get the wrong idea, right? So you want to control it. We had a baseline. Uh, so we were trying to get at that. Um, and so this is, this is the point, not point number two, which is that there is both a positive and negative effect, meaning if I show them a low stability visualization, that actually, uh, um, actually decreases the rating. And if I show them a high stability visualization, that actually increases rating, no matter what kind of article it is, no matter what the topic area is. They're paying only attention to the visualization itself. Um, and so uh, this is more work needs to be done to understand what kind of visualization we really should be presenting. And the and baseline here is no visualization? The baseline is no visualization at all. At least so, it's going in the right direction. It's yeah, so at least it's kind of moving in ways that are predictable. But 
from just even the brief conversation I had with Corey, uh, she said that you know there's there's some really interesting things that you guys are struggling through with Fast Dash. So I'd be interested in talking to Bang Shen about that, um, about these kind of visualizations. Um, if I remember correctly, they uh, in in the mechanical Turk task. I need to look back on the paper again. Uh, is I think they had a training task before they actually did one task, and then they basically disappear, or they can do another task if they want to. So, um, yeah, I mean, with mechanical Turk, there's certain kinds of control that you can do, and certain kinds of control that you can't do. Uh, that's tricky, and so. Um, you know, so for example, doing uh, 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 between subject designs is actually really difficult in Mechanical Turk. So you, we typically have just actually done um, after we're filtering, just take out the data data that where people didn't adhere to the between subject protocol. Um, okay, so that's the kind of evaluation that we're doing. Um, I also wanted to tell you about. Um, I feel like I'm going a mile a minute, so. <laughs> uh, Another thing that I really wanted to tell you about was Mr. Taggy, um, which actually started out with, um, I'm, forgive me, I'm just going to flash this, okay? Uh, because we, we published this paper in CSCW where we also use Mechanical Turk to um, go and study people's search behavior. We, we, we did a kind of a version of a critical instance survey where we just said, uh, the question was just simply, tell me the last time that you did a search that you think was interesting. Um, tell me what you did, whether you interacted with anybody beforehand, what did you do during the search, what search engine did you use, what was the result, uh, did you have any social interaction while you were using the search tool, um, and then afterwards, uh, did you distribute your result to anybody, uh, et cetera. Right? So we, we did this on Mechanical Turk, paid 25 cents each, and got 150 uh, critical instance surveys, so kind of a very Think of it as a very cheap ethnography tool, uh, uh, basically what we did. And then we published the results in CSCW. One of the most interesting things that we found ab out about this was, um, was the fact that there is sort of uh, this vocabulary problem that people are dealing with. So roughly, at least in our data, there were um, roughly about almost about 40% of search that were more navigation and transactional, where the existing search engines really worked pretty darn well. People are, don't have a problem with these. But at least in the other um, roughly 60% of the time where people are doing informational searches where you sort of know what you want but don't really know how to find it, well, you don't quite know what the terminology is. So actually the, uh, the Windburn example is a good one. Um, it turns out that there's two ways to spell Windburn, of course. Windburn with a space in between and Windburn without a space in between. And so when I did my search, I actually had to use both and, and you know, so you, in that case, at least I knew what the terminology was, right? So I, I could have typed in red face after skiing, which would have been not quite as good. Um, but the point is that there's, the existing search engines have more of a problem in this space, in this informational uh, search space. And a lot of the social interactions that we discovered in the CSCW paper were more fo focused on uh, people who have failures were more focused in this area. Um, and we actually, subsequent to this CSCW paper, we're um, working on this right now with Brendan Evans, is uh, we actually then did a second follow-up study where we collected another 150 data points, asked people where, when they have failed. And actually, this number actually goes up. It goes up to 80%. So people are failing 80% of the time in these kinds of informational searches. And so um, our thought was that perhaps we could um, take advantage of essentially think of social bookmarking as a way of people leaving navigational signposts behind for people. And if we can use this to help them search things, uh, and then it, it kind of tries to get at the vocabulary uh, uh, problem. right? So for example, maybe you're on a search engine just because you're interested in looking on cool, interesting physics science problems. Well, they're very vague informational science problem, right? So uh, what this video is des designed to, uh, to uh, demonstrate is, uh, let's say, for example, you're interested in finding beautiful galleries. Well, um, 
you, you type in these keywords, click on the tag cloud, you, um, on the left hand side you have these sort of related tags that give you a sense of the informational space that you're in. So you can click on them to go to different spaces um, and then get at actual photo uh, galleries. This again is a tool that we've released live on the web so if you just go to mrtaggy.com you can try it out yourself and, and let me know what you think of the experience. So here's an example I like which is let's say you're interested in fitness but you don't like to exercise. So you say fitness but no exercise. So you can click on these sort of up and down uh, thumbs. Uh, and so now you can very quickly get to only things that are relating to diet and nutrition. So you start out in one place where, yeah, I'm interested in getting more fit, but then you can sort of just direct the search engine toward one direction versus another using relevance feedback. Here's another example where a couple of months ago I was going to New York and I was trying to figure out how to get from JFK to Manhattan again because each time I had to look up exactly what line was. So I type in JFK, and then, but up comes a bunch of things about JFK the person. Um, so I say, no, I'm not interested in conspiracy, not interested in politics, but yes, I'm interested in travel, I'm interested in New York City, NYC actually. Um, and then the system sort of brings me to that space of, you know, yeah, here's, you can take a helicopter into Manhattan, or you can share a taxi, or you can take the subway. It's three good choices, if you had the money to pay for the helicopter. Um, so that's, that's what that tool is about. And um, the way we built the system was uh, we took that 150 million bookmarks that I told you about, using some of those uh, information theory ideas to build up a semantic similarity graph of the fact that when people use the word tutorial, they tend to use it with uh, the word tutorials. So we, don't, we can deal with the, the stemming problem. But they also use it, tend to use it with words like tip and tricks and tip and help and how to, etc. Right? Um, one of the things that we discovered that was, that was probably not, well at least for me at the time, was a little bit of a surprise to me was um, there's some really interesting typos in the system. So people tend to uh, have uh, tutorial and tutorials are um, commonly, very highly commonly occurred with each other. And that's because if you look on your keyboard, T and R are right next to each other. Mm -hmm. And since that tutorials actually contains both T and R, people tend to mistype that a lot. So tutorials is actually a common mistypo. Um, so we can find all these kinds of patterns uh, through this sim similarity graph. And uh, the way that we implemented this basically is, on the, think of this problem as being a, a, a bi graph. So you have tags on the one side and URLs on the other side. If you have this huge database of, of, of counts, basically, count, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> and then you can now actually compute these probabilities. So what is the probability of, given that the word is tutorials, that's the tags, what's the probability of people interested in these different kinds of URLs? And then you can compute the vice versa, right? So given that people are interested in these URLs, what are the tags that they input to describe those URLs? So you can have the probabilities on both sides. So you can build up this bi graph of a huge probability matrix, basically. And then you do a, a, a kind of Bayesian analysis on top of it we call spreading activation. Um, and so we compute it over this very large data set uh, using MapReduce. And um, uh, the way that we did this was uh, we crawled the data set. We've been crawling this for the last year and a half. Put it into a MySQL database. <coughs> then we put it into a MapReduce system that computes all these spreading activation patterns. Store the result out into a Lucene index. So we have all the patterns ready to go in a, in a Lucene database, uh, basically. And then the web server, whenever you type in a keyword like JFK, <coughs> We very quickly go into the Lucene database, look up that pattern, and combine it with all the other patterns, all the other keyword patterns that, that you have specified. And then have a little UI front end that basically interacts with it. So that's how the system is, roughly how, how it builds. Some of the interesting things that we did from the engineering side, I don't know how many you know, sort of real research engineers are in the room, so I want to throw a little bit of technical things like this in here, was a lot of the struggle turns out to be how do you get this computation down to a manageable size? So uh, the, it turns out if you do the back of the envelope calculation, you add one more machine, mm, kind of makes it 1% dent. So you could, 
you could either throw 200 machines at it, or you can try and make your algorithm better. So a lot of our time in the last two years has been spent on trying to figure out where, sh where we can throw things away, where we can optimize. And now this uh, over 150 million bookmarks we can do on a 40 machine cluster, we can do this in a single day right now. So we've optimized to a, to a, to a certain point. And then the, the scoring function required a lot of iteration as well. So one, uh, another evaluation that we did, published just uh, a month ago uh, at Kai, was um, I don't uh, no, no time for details, unfortunately. Um, but I think pretty exciting kind of uh, evaluation that we did. Um, and I encourage you, if you're interested in experiment, uh, evaluation kind of things, uh, to look up the results here. Because I think that the implication is kind of interesting. The exp we, we compared people who use the exploratory uh, exploratory interface where they get to click on all these related tags and things like that versus the system where they didn't get to do that. They just got to do the normal keyword search engine kind of interaction. Exploratory interfaces uh, users perform more query, not surprising because the interaction cost is lower, but they took more time with their tasks. Oh, that's kind of interesting. They also wrote better summary, so we the kind of task we gave them was go find out about uh, uh, enterprise mashups, and and then write a little essay over an eight-minute period, and then we score those essays to say, kind of just like taking a high school exam. <laughs> Go learn about this area and then write a little essay, and then we score those, and they wrote better summaries. We also at, took away the interface and said, okay, now that you've learned about enterprise mashup, now generate lots of keywords that you think someone who's an expert in this area should know. They generated more relevant keywords in that process. Um, and they, uh, by a NASA cognitive load uh, survey, they had higher cognitive load while they were doing the task. Okay. So what this suggests, the experimental evaluation, is that there's a deeper engagement. Maybe they're learning the area better. Okay. So that's what I think is happening. So the three domains that we had was, one was um, find out about future architecture. So as in Le Corbusier and you know, mid-century or, or even more future kind of uh, architecture. The second one was global warming. Go learn about global warming and tell us about it. The third one was uh, enterprise mashup. And um, the, the better summary and more relevant keywords, they tended to be um, more on the high ambiguous domain areas. So for example, uh, the keyword architecture, uh, if you use our system, it could either mean architecture as in software architecture. I mean, after all, delicious users tend to be geeks, right? So they tend to talk about architecture as in software architecture. But there is also data in, in the, the uh, bookmark system about architecture as in building architecture. So we were asking them to find out about future you know, building architecture. And so in those sort of more ambiguous domains, uh, Mr. Taggy tends to do better. In, in areas where uh, keywords are more specific, like enterprise mashup, it's hard to mistake mashup for another meaning. Though in those cases, in the, in the one dom that's one domain where it didn't do as well. So it's, it's suggestive that the explorer, exploratory interface is better at helping people learn. Um, that, that's sort of the implication of this. <coughs> Uh, I have four minutes left, and I don't want to take up the entire time. So I'm just going to say that um, another system that we built is a, uh, a tagging system that I have no time to talk about. It's called Spartacus, <coughs> where the idea is that as you read a paragraph, you just simply annotate it, click on words to annotate it. And um, we have a, this is kind of a little bit like CoSense. Uh, in that sense. So you, you, you can collect these paragraphs and, and end up with a sense-making interface. And you can share these results with other people. You can click on a, on, a, on a button and say, send this paragraph to people, et cetera. So we're also building these kind of more CSCW-like kind of interfaces for, uh, for sharing. And we also did an evaluation on this that um, I don't have time for. So um, I did want to show this one sort of final 
final slide before I conclude. Um, uh, earlier, I, I know some of you would be interested in understanding sort of where are my thoughts in terms of, of technology development. Um, the, the way I've been organizing the, the technology development uh, within my group has been the idea that there's these what I call app connectors, the idea that there's these systems that generate lots of data in sort of tuple form. So uh, Wikipedia would be a user with the edit, with the timestamp, with whatever. So that's the tuple. Uh, in social tagging would be the user, the tag, the URL, and a timestamp. So that would be a four tuple. And these things all generate tuples of some form. They feed into sort of a computational platform of some sort, some sort of analytical engine, where like the uh, Mr. Tagging example, where we're doing sort of these map reduce Bayesian analysis on top of it, but you can imagine doing the same thing with Wikipedia data, you can imagine doing it with other kinds of uh, tuple data, where you have operators like uh, tag normalization, like summarization operators, uh, maybe uh, add in some sort of voting analysis, etc. And then you have underlying technology like MapReduce and PIG and MySQL and Java and Django and, uh, and all that. And then out comes hopefully a bunch of applications on the other. And I just show you sort of three examples of that. So that's kind of how I see technology development in this area that, um, that, that I'm interested in uh, from a computer science perspective. Uh, this is the part where I, I always do this. I stand in the middle <laughs> to say that, you know, I, even though I've been the area manager of this, this area, this is actually, I'm presenting the work of a cast of about seven people. And this is our team, plus the, uh, uh, the um, business development guy, Lawrence Lee. So uh, their credit should also be up here on the table. Uh, that's it. So uh, I'd be happy to take more questions if you guys remember all that content. Thanks a lot. Questions, comments, annoyances? Thank you very much on yeah. what you have done. What, what are you doing going forward? I mean, what are the big areas that you think are sort of right? Uh, uh, the, there are some things that I can't talk openly, okay, because, uh, obviously. But I'll tell you two directions that, that we're going. So uh, one thing that, that we have been pushed to do more of is realizing that in the enterprise, getting people to use wikis and getting people to do blogging and getting people to do social tagging it turned out to be a lot harder than we thought. We, you know, in the beginning, I was like, oh, this is such an exciting technology. Everyone's going to want to adopt it. Of course, that's not the case. So one of the things that we've been looking at actually is doing more um, using email as proxies to these systems. Uh, so um, using, analyzing email for reputation, e analyzing um, uh, CMS systems, content management systems for building up profiles of you. There's one paper in Kai, for example, where this idea of you have a special folder, just like this, the same thing that you have systems where you have a special public drop folder, where things that you put in there or, or people, other people can put things into that folder that you're interested in or things that you think other people should be interested in. Well, there's a paper in Kai where the idea is that you drop documents into that, and then the system automatically learns about what you're interested in and starts to do recommendations. So we're starting to look at systems of that type, for example. Uh, another s things that we've been uh, looking at is this idea called work streaming. So the idea that um, there's an effort here. I forget who it was that was involved in it. But there's an effort at Microsoft called Social Desktop. So the idea that, yeah, Lily's work, OK. So the idea that. You're on your machine, and you actually generate lots of activity information, right? I mean, you're interacting with that website, you're interacting with that. And, and what's happening in the consumer web is that people are aggregating this into friend feed and Facebook and things like that. Well, if that also happens in an enterprise, we can start doing fast dash kinds of visualizations, uh, not just on code development, but ov also over their entire information work space. So, that's two area that our team is kind of currently looking at at the moment, um, but there's lots of other opportunities. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot, that's just on the technology side. And then there, on the science side, you know, further investigation into social tagging systems, Wikipedia, what happens after 2006? We, <laughs> right now, I don't have good answers for this. Those are, would be very interesting things to go after. Does collective intelligence actually work? 
it's interesting to me that you found that um, cognitive load went up when they were when they were exploring. Natalie and I were just talking about this. What kind of cognitive load measures could you use to study that even further? And when is it good that they go up, and when is it good that they go down? Kind of thing. So the the reason why I showed that slide was because if you only look at that one single measure, you can't say anything about what That's people were doing. But if you have convergent measures that says they're generating better keywords, they're generating better summaries, they're taking more time, just the same way as their cognitive load is going up. But having, having them spend less time on the task shouldn't be the only thing that you're optimizing for. So when you have these convergent measures and you say, oh, they're actually better engaged, they're actually more scaffolded in their task, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Right. So. Then when they came back, they retrieved it so much faster because they processed that. that yeah, the deeper, system. deeper processing yeah. hypothesis, yeah, depth of processing. Any other questions? You just did a lot of stuff with um, mechanical Turk. Can you talk about that, like um, especially uh, validity, cross validating that? With yeah. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the story behind that is actually really interesting because uh, Nikki came back to uh, my group to do a second intern, uh, summer internship. And when he came back, um, he sort of, I forget whether he came up with the idea of using Mechanical Turk or whether, whether we jointly came up with it in the hallway or what, but he went and did one, one set of, of, of studies and came back and it was, the data was horrible. I mean, it was 50% spam. We went through all the results by hand and it's like, this is never going to work. 50% spam. How would you ever even get the noise out of the system? Um, and, then, um, and so he was ready to give up. He was like, okay, that's it. I'm, not, I'm done with this idea. I'm going to move on. And I said, you know what? Let's just try one more. Just one tiny little thing. And um, I came up with this really pretty stupid idea, which was uh, what we were trying to do is get them to pay attention to the article. So I just said, what if we just put in an, a, a question like, what is the fourth word of the second paragraph? Mm -hmm. Something, even though it's very easy to compute using, you know, I mean, this is not really CAPTCHA, mm -hmm. but very easy. To, someone can write a program to do this. But for, 50, for five cents, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. right? So let's just do that and see what will happen. 50% span rate beforehand, 2% span rate after you put a question like that in. So Exactly. So, I mean, we know exactly what the fourth word on the second paragraph should be. And so we can just very quickly go through. And it's also s function as a signaling mechanism to the user saying, hey, we're checking your results. You can't just, you know, do anything you want. And that alone was enough to bring the, the, uh, the result all the way uh, back in line. So, Now, you know, interestingly enough, you could, one could build up a whole three-person team just to spend more time looking at me, uh, mechanical Turk kind of things. I think it's highly fascinating to people that it works at all. Um, uh, but there's, it turns out there's other people who have taken our result and, and built on top of it. So, for example, one group of people, at, um, I think it was New York University, I can't remember where, where it was, where they actually looked at the demographic of the people who are on mechanical Turk and actually it fits reasonably well with the general U.S. population, so the distribution is about the same. It tends to be have higher education than otherwise, but be beyond that, in terms of gender, makeup, and other kinds of demographics, it's about the same. Uh, and uh, and also, there's a, 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 a there's actually a company called Dolores Lab, just a two-person company in San Francisco, that is doing um, uh, sort of. Uh, consulting services for people who want to use Mechanical Turk for doing evaluations or doing surveys or whatever. And they've been doing some sort of like collection over time. If you want people who are all female, they can do it for you. If you want you know, people who are only from 20 to 30 years old, at least self-reported, um, they can do that for you because they've been building up over time. This worker ID corresponds to this demographic. So people have been building up on top of this a little bit more. Okay, thanks.